Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I have the immense pleasure of having uh, for the second time a conversation with uh, Judy Shelton, one of the greatest economists that uh, the United States has and not only a senior uh, fellow at the Independent Institute but also the author of this phenomenal book that I have recommended so many times in my channel, Money Meltdown, uh, but also the forthcoming one, Good as Gold, How to Unleash the Power of Sound Money. Judy, how are you? <laughs> great, great. So wonderful to see you. It is so wonderful to see you again, knowing that you have a new book. And I think it could not be a better time because if there is a moment to talk about sound money, it is probably now with persistent inflation, real wages coming down and people suffering. No, uh, why don't you explain in a brief summary what the book is about and what we can find? And by the way, for to everyone that is watching, you will have a purchasing link in the details below. Well, that's very kind of you. Um, this book represents my views, not just as an economist, but looking on sound money as, as a moral issue. And uh, when I went through the nomination process to become a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, I did not succeed, I came close. But I found that just talking about the importance of being able to rely on, on money, and particularly the US dollar, that, that our nation's unit of account should be reliable, independent. It should be a store of value that people can count on. It should be a, a meaningful unit of account across borders. And, and that it should be a, a, a tool of measurement. The founding principles for the United States were based on, on the idea that money is meant to work for the people, for a self-governing people. Thomas Jefferson wrote his notes on the establishment of a money unit for the United States. And he really emphasized it should be familiar to people, convenient to use. It should facilitate commerce, not complicate it. So when I was up, having been nominated, up for consideration for the Federal Reserve, I felt it was reasonable to talk about the importance of being able to count on money, have confidence in money. And I think it's useful as, as somewhat of a monetary historian, my work at the Hoover Institution, to go back and look at prior international monetary systems and, and to compare them in terms of how economies performed under, for example, the classical international gold standard or under the Bretton Woods International Monetary System. And, and having been friends for decades with, with people like Alan Greenspan and Paul Volcker and, and Robert Mundell co-hosting with him his, his annual International Monetary Conference in Siena, being a co-chair with, with a hero of mine, Robert Mundell, I, I felt very comfortable talking about gold. All those gentlemen, easily talk about monetary systems and relate it to gold. Even Greenspan, as I was going through the travails of being considered, would see headlines about me being called a gold bug as if that was something terrible. <laughs> and I remember one email from him one morning after the Washington Post said something about, oh, this gold bug quackery. He said, he wrote back, if it's so crazy to have gold, why does the United States own so much of it? and other major governments as well. So bottom line, I thought, I'm going to double down on the position that when the dollar was good as gold, that meant something. There's something to be learned from having a monetary system anchored so that fiscal recklessness doesn't run away with people's savings, doesn't make them a victim of the government using money as just another economic tool. And, uh, and so this book is about not just re-examining what we can learn from prior systems, but in the end, putting forth a concrete initiative to begin to bring us back to being concerned enough about monetary integrity, that we're willing to stake our future fiscally responsible behavior and a real commitment 
to stable money from the Federal Reserve on a viable link between the dollar and gold. And I think that would be historic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think that the I am looking forward to read the book, obviously, because it's it's I think it's a critical factor, what you're saying right now, because citizens are really discontent. You see all over America, but also in the euro area, how uh, real wages are negative, how there is uh, a, a very difficult, very significant difficulties to make ends meet for the average family, etc. People don't understand why they are being told over and over again that this is a strong economy. And at the same time, they're struggling more than ever. And the link between fiscal responsibility and the monetary system and the purchasing power of the currency in which we receive our salary and which we use to purchase our goods and services is sometimes lost on people, isn't it? Um, what do you think that can be done in order to uh, avoid the perverse incentive of governments to run reckless trillion dollar deficits and then blame inflation on supermarkets or on corporations or on or whatever else that's a very tough question because we've seen under both republican and democratic administrations that overspending happens i i am heartened that um uh, president trump is talking about being more responsible in terms of balancing the budget. I think that's very important. What we have now um, with, when you have federal government and an administration that is engaged in deficit spending and sprinkling money all over the country and pet projects and generating economic activity and pressure on resources, both human and uh, physical, at the same time that the Federal Reserve is trying to stifle economic activity. And the whole idea of having a restrictive interest rate is to cramp demand and, and to put pressure on companies that they, they can incur the higher borrowing costs. So they don't expand, they don't hire new workers. All of those, those negatives that actually impact people in terms of potential increases or, or jobs that they might have gotten, um, and that's considered the appropriate sacrifice to yeah. fight inflation. And, and it's kind of a, a double whammy. First off, I don't think monetary policy can get ahead of out-of-control fiscal spending. You, you could go to 10%, 20% interest rates, but if the government is increasing transfer payments or decides that universal basic income is a great idea, that's going to put money in people's pockets. That's going to get spent. If you forgive... Um, hundreds of billions in student loans, all of a sudden that's much more money that's available to consumers. Uh, I just don't see how, how monetary policy can make up for that. What you're really doing is just shifting power to government at the expense of the private sector, because whereas high borrowing costs really do impose a cost for small business in particular, uh, it's no barrier to government. Government, our treasury will pay whatever it takes to raise the money to buy, to issue the treasury debt that pays for the um, deficit spending. So I think it's very unhealthy, the track that we're, we're currently on. How do you, now you asked, how do you, how do you get government to be responsible? Yeah. The ideas now are a commission, you know, a commission is always kind of a, kind of a cop out. <laughs> I guess the idea is that you share blame, but when I've been approached about that idea, uh, I always say, well, but what if I want to stand up for the position that the problem is not lack of revenue? We're raising record levels of revenue. It's the, it's the spending. We're spending even more than we're taking in. And uh, the projections show that that's going to continue at record levels, both for what the government receives and what the government spends. And I say, so, so if I bring that attitude that that's where we have to cut, can, what would that mean for a commission? And I've been told, no, the idea of a commission is to compromise. And compromise means raising taxes. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think lack of taxes is the problem. So I'm, I'm not very optimistic about that approach. 
Um, some I've talked with some um, speakers of the House for various states. They think we could get a constitutional amendment if you had enough states willing to push for that to, to require the government to balance the budget. I like the idea. But again, with so much entitlement spending, uh, it's going to be very difficult unless you also tackle uh, Social Security reform at the same time. I do think we can start whittling things down, but only with a pro-growth program. Yeah. And that's going to mean uh, certainly not increasing taxes. I would want to perpetuate the, the tax cuts that we got under the Trump administration. And I think less regulation always. The United States is well poised to take advantage of, of innovative private sector developments in artificial intelligence and other areas. Uh, growth is always the answer. So I would go back to a supply side program. It's always worked for the U.S. to go back to lower taxes, stable money, good energy policy. I'd like to say free trade. I think that's coming under pressure. But for a lot of reasons that I agree with, the main one being if countries compete with you by depreciating their currency against yours, I consider that quite unfair. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm a free trader so long as we have a level international monetary playing field. I don't like central banks playing games, raising rates, or I think in Europe, you'll probably lower before we do. And ostensibly, it's, it's because maybe you think your inflation problem is, is in better shape, or maybe you think your economy needs it more. But at the same time, I think it's, it, it doesn't make sense to overlook or dismiss the impact on trade and financial flows that are a result of differential monetary policy paths for the world's major central banks. Absolutely. You just raised a very important question because um, the, Euro, uh, the European Central Bank is considering cutting rates in June. However, there are seven countries in the euro area that have a higher than 3% inflation rate. And that is obviously uh, not, uh, I would call, a victory on inflation. The fact that the average of the euro area is coming down because Germany is in contraction doesn't mean that inflation is under control. So it is going to cut rates, which ultimately means a higher level of money supply in the system and a more than probable depreciation of the euro relative to the dollar. Uh, but uh, but it's not uh, because they have been able to combat inflation. It's because the euro area is in contraction. But the euro area is not in contraction because monetary policy is restrictive. It was already in contraction with negative nominal rates, no? So that's a very dangerous situation. But you mentioned something that I think is incredibly important, is that the only way in which you get out of this mess of two trillion annual deficits in a growing economy is with pro-growth policies, not by raising taxes. Because when you get higher tax revenues, as the Biden administration is getting right now, you're still going to overspend. Actually, you act, they overspend even more than what they initially planned. And even in their own projections, between 2024 and 2030, there's an estimated $17 trillion of additional deficit, which is, which is incredible. And you also mentioned that the problem is mandatory spending, not just uh, the discretionary spending. So it has to come from allowing companies, businesses to thrive, families to have a currency that is stronger and therefore consumption comes from improvement, not from taking more debt, which is what is happening right now. Um, but one of the elements that I think is, is also very important of what you just said is that the, the current monetary policy is incredibly dangerous for the private sector because on the one hand monetary policy is restrictive and higher rates and uh, tightening of the balance sheet is hurting small and medium enterprises and families 
while the government is spending like there's no tomorrow, like drunken sailors, as Clint Eastwood used to say, and uh, it does not care about rising yields, no? So there is a transfer of wealth from the private sector to government and a massive crowding out. Do you see that crowding out in the economy? Oh, I think you expressed it perfectly, definitely. And I think it also helps to explain why there is this uh, bifurcation. There is this sense um, for a lot of Americans that things are not so great. Absolutely. And, and they're especially aware of the psychic cost of going to the market and paying for gas. It's mm. just, I heard someone just today say that he and his wife had, had stopped at a McDonald's and paid $20 for lunch. He said, that's insane. <laughs> and, and I think that there really is this, this sense that, that didn't exist until, um, well, until after the Biden administration came into power. And a year later, we hit 9% inflation. I mean, especially for um, our, our generation, people in the early 20s now, they, they don't know what hit them. They, yeah. they never had inflation as a, as a problem. In a way, they were spoiled. But now I think they see aspirations um, hitting reality and they don't see a chance to ever own a home. Uh, transportation and shelter costs for them are extremely high. Uh, you, you are so right. The restrictive rate is hurting uh, small business, households um, who now get this double whammy through mm. no fault of their own. They're having to suffer not just from the inflation, but from those high interest rates on credit card debt for mortgages, as I mentioned. And um, I, I think that it, they're sort of being doubly punished and Meanwhile, the government, no barrier, they keep borrowing. That's also adding to the deficit. Um, we're going to spend a trillion on financing the debt in the next year. Uh, that's more than we spend on, on defense, on yeah. so many other important aspects of, of US viability. And now it's gonna be spent on, on debt payments. And this brings up something I find uh, quite interesting. I've been critical for many years of the Fed's model. Hmm. I think that their model for fighting inflation um, has really proved to be quite short-sighted, and it might lead to real policy mistakes. We know that when uh, Chairman Jerome Powell said back in July of 2022 at the Jackson Hole Conference that this is going to be painful. We're going to have to raise rates and people are going to lose jobs and we're going to have to curtail growth, but it will be worth it. <laughs> it's good for you because in the end, that's how we fight inflation. Well, I think the people on the Federal Open Market Committee, the Fed's Monetary Policy Making Committee, were very confused but relieved when we didn't get a cut in growth. We've had unbelievable growth. Two quarters ago, 4.9% the United States. Then the last quarter of 2023, it was 3.4%. Now the first quarter of this year, it's uh, 1.6. So something's happening. It is restrictive in, in some ways, but the Fed's formula for fighting inflation is really what we would call a one trick pony. All they can do is raise interest rates. They, gotcha. they acknowledge that's a very blunt instrument. They say we can't affect supply, we can only affect demand. But if you think of it, the, the Fed's actions in having high interest rates is also fueling the inflation. Absolutely. Uh, because for the larger companies that can afford to pay the higher borrowing cost, because there is still demand for their product, for those companies, a higher borrowing cost, cost of capital, just is added as another cost of doing business. It goes to the bottom line. It increases the price of, of the goods that they offer or the services. Um, the Fed itself is paying banks not to make loans. The Fed is paying 5.4% to commercial banks to leave their money sitting there at the Fed 
not being loaned out to customers, not being invested anywhere, just sitting, sterile, dormant. 5.4% is a pretty good return for taking no risk. And the, the Fed ended up paying $280 billion last year. That's now going straight into the economy. That's real money to the banks that receive that interest. And even now their customers are demanding it. Uh, they want to be paid a higher rate. They've been getting next to nothing for so many years. And a lot of customers are saying, we want to be paid closer to 5.4% on our deposits of cash. So all the money that the, our federal government is paying to those who hold our bonds, that's also more income going into the economy. People didn't expect to make that much on, on those kind of bond holdings. And yet that now adds to their capabilities for consumption for goods and services. So I think just adding that extra trillion to the deficit enlarges the, the difference between revenues and expenditures and fiscal stimulus. All of that, again, is, is doing the exact opposite of what the Fed is hoping to do in trying to restrain economic growth. All of that is, is stimulating it and putting more pressure on prices. Mm. So it's, it's ironic to me that, that the Fed is now even considering, looking at the minutes that were just released, raising interest rates. And I get it. I get it. But I also think that at some point it kind of flips. There's kind of a, a sweet zone. Yeah. where it is effective to be restrictive. But as, as, as companies and government say that's not a problem for us, they're continuing to fuel consumption. People are getting cost of living increases. I mean, the Fed's dirty little secret is it, it doesn't want to say we don't want you to get <laughs> cost of living increases. They say we want a sustainable rate that's consistent with our 2% goal. Well, that means people have to be receiving less than than inflation to get ahead on that count. And um, I just I detest all the money illusion. That's part of the Keynesian formulas that central banks use in, in letting people think they're getting gains. But in fact, they're really not keeping up with inflation. Absolutely, they're not. And obviously, uh, inflation is a, is a, is calculated as CPI, which is an average of a basket that uh, gives an image of a lower figure that is not necessarily what people perceive when they go and purchase their McDonald's meal or when they go to get their, their to to fill up the the gas tank. But I think that there's also a very dangerous element here: is that the Fed is looking at the government and is trying to get the economy into shape. It's trying to get, it's, it's, like, it's like a gym teacher that's trying to get a, a gym class to get everybody in shape, but there's one that is eating all the cookies and one that is eating all the candy. <laughs> And, and 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 they're making an average, and so they're they're making everyone starve because there's one that's eating all the cookies and all the candy, which is government. So ultimately, what is what I find that is very dangerous about this uh, aggregate view of the economy that the that the Fed imposes uh, is that by ignoring money supply coming from deficit spending they're actually ignoring the negative impact on the small businesses and on families and i'm i'm exceedingly worried when i look at all of the things that that come up come from the united states and i always tell to my students that i come from the future i'm in the euro area that don't don't follow the euro area principles because you end up getting the euro area type of growth and type of unemployment rates and that's uh, that's not something that the united states can, needs to get what it needs is what you just said is pro growth policies no um so what i see basically is that the only way in which you're going to curb deficit spending is if you have a government that has deficit spending as a goal to to bring it down and that that has the view that it has to bring it down via spending, not via revenues, because there's so much that you can do in terms of milking the cow, because yeah. <laughs> because the fa families, you said it is, is families and businesses and small businesses in particular are being hit by inflation and by uh, higher rates and higher taxes. 
because the because the higher taxation is a burden on all of those uh, citizens because they, they say no we're only taxing corporations and the rich well it's feeding through to you in the in the price of a of a big mac no i i think taxes are a huge part of it and um it's interesting people if you talk to people on an individual level or in in polls when they say what concerns them Hmm. Um, the, the lack of, of fiscal responsibility, it bothers them that yeah. the government overspends. It, it bothers them. And, and of course, nobody likes to pay taxes. We see uh, an argument being made, oh, it's all because of corporate greed. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I really think that's, that's the last refuge of a scoundrel. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's suddenly that it's, it's corporate greed. And um, I don't know when it, I hope the U.S. can continue to celebrate entrepreneurship, can can rejoice in the success of people. I think we're so lucky to have individuals like Elon Musk. Um, the people that generate wealth and and engage in productive economic enterprise that 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 provides opportunity and raises living standards for the whole society. I just think they are blessed. I yeah. love entrepreneurs. And I think bankers, it's really, it's really a noble art to be able to, to channel the savings of others, the seed corn, into the most promising projects. To be able to judge someone on their character, their competence or business plan and say, you are worth taking a chance on. Not every project is going to pan out, but you are worth it. I really yeah. love, I love the art of financial intermediation. And um, it's, it's troubling to me that when monetary policy ends up making suckers out of savers or ends up rewarding pure speculation on financial assets, when monetary policy channels benefits to people who are wealthy enough to already own financial assets to the to the the loss of people who just were doing the right thing and putting money in the bank every week we saw that when the fed engaged in zero interest rates for so long after 2008 and then and then again after 2020 for 3 years um it's just a mistake i think to distort the way price signals would tell markets, here's how we recover. Yeah. Here's the project. Here you can you can actually recognize the risk reward parameters of this investment opportunity because the money is a is a reliable measure. And you can say at this interest rate and that level of risk, that's worth it. But once everything is at zero, <laughs> hmm. Then, then it, I think that that really stultifies the the whole art of banking for productive results, and I think it took us a long time to come out of that. Ironically, it was when um, after Trump came in in November 2016, he'd been elected. He would take office in 2017. The United States had gone from 2008 to December 2015 with zero rates and with heavy buying of government assets, quantitative easing under Chairman Bernanke at the Federal Reserve. Janet Yellen first raised a quarter point in December 2015. She didn't raise again until a year later after our 2016 presidential election in December 2016. Trump came in. Yellen was still chair. She raised three more times. Powell was appointed by Trump. Powell raised four more times. And then Trump, as everyone knows, became very critical of the Federal Reserve. He said, there's no sign of inflation. We were well below the 2% target. In fact, our Fed was experiencing angst because no matter what it did, it couldn't seem to push inflation up quite to 2%, though it tried. And I think Trump started criticizing the Fed because he said, why are you needlessly raising rates if we don't have inflation? And meantime, the economy liked 
that rates had somewhat started to normalize. Yes, it was quick, nine successive increases, and um, but it was starting to work. We had the lowest unemployment we'd ever had. We had good growth. So the years 2018 and 2019 were very good for the United States. Um, actually, it was good minorities who hadn't had such job opportunities before found they had many opportunities. So, so in many ways, social and economic, it was a very powerful, good era of prosperity, uh, was interrupted <laughs> rudely <laughs> by, by COVID. But I think we had to take some lessons from that. The market actually prefers to have real interest rates to discern yeah. true value on, on investments. And um, we lost that again. But when the Fed started to raise, I think part of the reason we still had good growth and low unemployment was because of that, that yes. we got back to something normal, something I think around four and a half. If, if we have a 2% inflation target, and rates, the Fed funds rate, our target rate, policy rate is at about four and a half. I think that makes sense to people because yes. the traditional real rate of interest would be around two and a half. And that's solid. But then the Fed kind of kept going, kept going. Its total formula has now boiled down into, well, we thought we fixed inflation. We don't know how. <laughs> they, were, they were gratified, but they were bewildered as to how Inflation did come down so quickly, and I think they declared victory too soon. And now, now the Fed is thinking, well, do we go back to the drawing board if it's starting to reaccelerate, yeah. or, or what do we do? And that's why I think we're in a dangerous period now, because we have to figure out if, if the Fed is, is engaged in overkill and is going to hurt the best part of the economy, where the innovation is, and the most productive part of the economy, where the jobs are made available, and that's through small business. Are we killing off that part, the best part of our economy, in order to to allow government and big big government and big business to mm. flourish? Yeah, and, and so that's why this is this is a pivotal point in determining what should be the model for fighting inflation, and is the Fed doing more harm than good? Yeah. I think that the problem is that the Fed is, is, it seems like it's in a battle in which it has to fight with only one tool, interest rates. Because in terms of liquidity, via the uh, window of liquidity, via different uh, ways, or right now uh, reducing the pace of normalization, but it's not reducing money supply. Uh, it continues to finance the the government if it's now going to uh, reduce the pace of uh, normalization of the balance sheet so it's only fighting with one with one tool which is interest rates it needs to inject liquidity if, you're, if a bank is in trouble it continues to reward uh, the lack of fiscal prudence by mm, changing the the balance sheet normalization when uh, yields reach the five the dangerous 5% level and um and at the same time what i find is 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 what you just said is that in 2016 to 2019 real wage growth in the united states was four times higher on an annual basis than the 2021 2024 period that means that in a that in a massive recovery in which economic growth has been quite significant the real wage growth has been in existence, actually negative, when between 2016 to 2019, you had strong real wage growth, improvement in unemployment, and at the same time, a much better uh, a much better reward for good investment. Well, I always say that the problem is that people don't seem to understand that Artificial money creation is never neutral. You can try to be as, mm -hmm. as political as you want, but it's always going to reward immediately the first recipient of money, which is government, it. and it's going to penalize the last recipient of money, which is real wages and deposit savings. So malinvestment is a risk almost in any type of, of, of scenario. But in the current scenario, Malinvestment is a guarantee when you're basically rewarding those that don't need 
to to um, don't don't need yields to be one way or the other to invest in things that are that are not working. Uh, the government is spending. So basically, you're you're rewarding lack of uh, of prudence. Do you think that, that is the, way, the 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 correct way of looking at it? Oh, definitely. I think there has to be a solid connection between effort and reward. Yes. And 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 I think our monetary policy has really contributed to the financialization mm. of the economy. And um, we've seen a lot of our manufacturing hollowed out for mm. for reasons having to do with, I think, the lack of a stable international monetary playing field. I think stable money is really part of the formula, as Mundell would say, stable money and low taxes. That, yeah. That's his formula. And that's what he says will, will always work. And uh, I'm a believer in that. Hmm. Um, you made me think, Daniel, of another change in those eras that you just cited. Um, we really have to pay more attention to the fact that the the instruments used by the Federal Reserve and, and, and all major central banks to some extent with some variation. But our Federal Reserve talks a lot about its toolbox. Yes. But that original tool, say what, what Paul Volcker did to fight inflation is vastly different from yes. what the Federal Reserve does today. And um, Volcker had to engage with markets. What he was really selling was just it was just um, twiddling around the edges. I mean, the Fed had a relatively small portfolio of government securities, but it could impact the rate at which banks made loans to each other. Now, why did banks make loans to each other? Because there was a reserve requirement. And literally once a week, every Wednesday, banks had to have a, a reserves at their deposit account at the Federal Reserve that reflected the, the way the reserve requirement was calculated relative to the deposits they held. And so banks that wanted to be loaned out might be willing to pay an overnight rate to borrow what they needed to meet the requirement that day. And banks that were more conservative were willing to sell their excess reserves in order to satisfy for the entire system that the banking system hit the total reserve requirement. And so the Fed was comfortable with that, even if banks uh, intermingled loans overnight to make it work. In the system, there were enough reserves. All of that forced banks to keep track of each other. You didn't want to be working with banks, buying and selling reserves overnight if they weren't financially coherent. So I think we lost that element of banks keeping an eye on each other. And the Federal Reserve then went to administered rates. Sure. Now there's no interaction with markets. The, the members of the Federal Open Market Committee simply decide eight times a year what should be the, the rate that they pay on these depository accounts. It's, it's kind of like a dictated rate, Soviet <laughs> diktat, I think, because it has nothing to do with markets. If they just decide. And so you don't read the Fed communique on the day they announce uh, an interest rate decision. Read the implementation note. That will tell you what instructions they're giving. And uh, at the last meeting on May 1, the instruction was to continue paying 5.4% on those accounts. That is 3.3 trillion, huge sum in bank reserves at a time there is no reserve requirement. There is no reserve requirement. Yeah. I think we have a very ambiguous regulatory structure for banks with intraday capital and leverage ratios that have to be met with examiners from the Fed housed within the banks. I think this change in the way the Fed carries out monetary policy, the mechanism itself, is trained banks to change their own operating models. Mm -hmm. Because now, instead of hiring a new loan officer so that they can make a potentially productive loan, they're more worried about compliance, more exactly. worried about uh, compliance with the Fed to meet those ratios. And so it's easier to just let the money sit there. 
So, so money supply that we used to count on as a way to, to find some correlation with inflation, that base money and, and those reserve accounts, with it's the reserve balances are part of base money, which is part of all the monetary aggregates. They build on each other. We have this huge increase in the money supply, but if the Fed is inducing banks not to release that into the economy, if they can keep that all bottled up by paying banks enough money for the banks to say, I'd rather just leave it there than engage in the hard work of figuring out how to invest it, then, then we're turning banks into utilities of government. They're really right. part of the instrument of using money to achieve government objectives, not to let money function as a meaningful unit of account that imparts accurate price signals, that facilitates free markets so that I think you can most efficiently allocate capital in ways that will enhance the long-term prosperity of the population. Yeah. So I think that's a very unhealthy transition the Fed has made to relying on administered rates as its chief tool for conducting monetary policy. It's secondary tool, um, purchasing, large-scale purchases of government assets has turned into a, a nightmare where the Fed, even though it got up to nine trillion and, and it's now at a mere seven and a half trillion in portfolio holdings held by our central bank, um, it's, that's, that's crazy, really. Mm -hmm. um, it took from March 2020 to three years later, um, the Fed accumulated uh, $5 trillion in government assets. The Fed was the largest purchaser of government debt. And then it said, now we're going to normalize. That's our new policy. Well, it's been another three years, and um, the, the Fed has only lost $1.5 trillion. So at this rate, it's going to take the Fed three times longer to reduce the amount it increased for COVID than it took to accumulate it. And now the Fed's most recent announcement is we're going to slow down. Yeah. We're going to slow down uh, selling back the portfolio. Well, that's that sent mi mixed signals. On the one hand, higher interest rates, but by, by stopping the monetary tightening or vastly reducing it, they're giving a signal in the opposite direction. Completely. And and this this idea that um, you basically penalize lending to the real economy, but you bloat liquidity and that liquidity, therefore, obviously goes to government assets, treasuries. And therefore, you find yourself in a in, in almost a catch 22 situation in which if you hike rates, you end up making those banks very weak because they have this enormous portfolio of government assets that are losing value on a daily basis. And if you don't hike interest rates, you're going to continue uh, increasing inflation. Ultimately, isn't it like what we're seeing is basically a slow process of nationalization of the economy? Because the government at the same time is constantly presenting itself as the solution to all the problems. And no wonder there are people out there defending upside down economics uh, or this modern monetary theory that is not modern. And it's certainly not a theory because it has been implemented numerous times with resounding failure in, in many economies. No? I, I think it is a slow drift toward a socialized economy. Yes. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the United States has always prided itself on being oriented toward free markets and the yeah. private sector. So this is um, a distressing change in, in our future for someone like me, who, who really does believe that um, the average person is a pretty smart person worthy of dignity and, and has merit and is knowledgeable. And, and I just feel like the money should work for everyone the same way. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that the founding principles of, of economic liberty and, and freedom meant that we really do believe in, in rule of law 
and that everyone has the same rights. And so it's bothersome to me that the way monetary policy works really fuels um, wealth inequality in ways that are, are unfair. I, I understand how the Tea Party movement, considered a rightist extreme movement, kind of um, intersects with the people who, who hate Wall Street, which kept coming from a, a, a left orientation, with, it comes together with the notion that it's rigged, that the system is exactly. rigged against exactly. individuals. And, and I think that's very unhealthy. I think that undermines uh, faith in the system. And um, so this, this drift of, towards socialization, toward empowering government, because I think central bank policies have enabled government to yes. engage in deficit spending. I remember in the old days, Paul Volcker, when when Ronald Reagan was coming in, he he did he actually said, "I agree with you that we need a tax system that incentivizes working and investment." So he did not want to increase taxes, and he said, "And I think we have too much regulation, and the biggest the biggest challenge is to balance the budget, but we can't do that without growth." Yes. So he really embraced the Reagan agenda and he was a Democrat, but he saw the need, the pressing need to tackle deficit spending. And he was willing to go with with a pro growth supply side agenda. But I think what really distinguished him from our current chairman of the Fed is that he did not shrink from criticizing the spending. And the most that um, Chair Powell will say is, well, it's unsustainable in, in the long run, but we have to stay in our lane and we take fiscal policy as given. As That's given. just a little, it's a little too convenient because what, what the Fed really should be saying to Congress is it, it's not helpful to pay people for not working because our, our transfer payments are out of control. And a lot of people don't have the incentive to work. Um, and so we have a problem of needing more employees. We need to push up, I think, labor participation and not make it too easy for people not to work and nevertheless get government transfer payments. If people are truly needy, I'm a bleeding heart conservative, but I, I think able-bodied people should not expect to be on the government dole, as we would say. And... Um, and so what I what I wish is in in turn that Congress would say to the Fed, but they don't criticize the Fed either. Fed doesn't criticize Congress. Congress doesn't criticize the Fed. They don't want to violate independence. But they really should also be saying it would be nice if you didn't pay banks not to make real loans. Absolutely. Instead, I mean, they've just trans they've just um, changed the terms of debt because the banks are really getting government guaranteed debt that generates an interest rate return. So in a way, the, the Treasury puts out debt in, in different denominations, maturities, uh, according to different yields. But um, the Fed can turn it all into um, cash that pays a return and it's guaranteed. Yeah, it's just a, it's a bad incentive system for legitimate banking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Completely. Well, Judy, what a fascinating conversation. I mean, we could have spent, uh, we, well, we have almost spent an hour eh? and I'm not going to take any more of your time, but I recommend everyone to read your books, particularly the new one. Eh? I remind everyone that you have a purchasing link in the details below. And uh, Judy, it's been an incredible chat. Uh, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it immensely. And uh, I would love it if we would continue it uh, in, a, in a near future. Thank you so much for defending freedom and wisdom. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. And I look forward to being with you again. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below and keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.